Hi, Evan. Thanks for joining me. Uh, thank you all for joining me. Uh, I've got today as my uh, guest, uh, Zooming with me, Evan Smith from Austin, who's a journalist, a uh, friend of mine. I think we've known each other now for well over 14 years or something. I think it goes all the way back to uh, uh, 12 years, I guess, because it goes back to 2008, doesn't it? And so, yeah, it feels like a, lo a long time ago. You're, I think of you as my personal spiritual leader. <laughs> I don't Everybody know. should I, have one. I, I, that you should have, every journalist should have one, and I'm glad to be exactly. yours. Uh, one time editor of Texas Monthly, CEO of Texas Tribune, founder of TribFest. One of the things I think that is one of the greatest accomplishments of getting people together, civic leaders, political leaders across the aisle. Hope we'll talk about that some. And sure. presently, are you still doing your interview overheard? Are you still doing that? I, I am. So we're in the 17th year of that show, believe it or not, under two different names, uh, wow. distributed around the country on an 85% of the markets on PBS stations. And we have had the great fortune to sit down with a number of wonderful people. You've been a guest on that show. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, at the moment, like everybody else, we're frozen in place. Uh, can't do it. Uh, and, you know, back to the nice, very co nice comments about the festival. I mean, again, we're all considering what it means to be in a public space together. The la you know, that festival, which was last September, yeah. may as well have been 11 million years ago in yeah. terms of yeah, right. the way that we think about gathering. And it's, uh, you know, you and I were visiting before we started today about the challenge on the faith side of the conversation of putting people in a sanctuary together. Right. On the journalism side of the conversation, putting people in a room together, virtual and literal to talk about the big issues that affect all of us. There's never been a more important time to do it, but there's never been a more difficult time to do it. Right, it's, it's a so, whole shifting from ways of behavior around the gathering. And on one hand, it has right. a lot of possibility in that you actually could put people in the same room together you might not have been able to physically, so it has some positive aspect, but it's right. really a completely different way of gathering. Uh, true. So I'll give you an example of how the, what you just said is so uh, dead on. Um, I teach one class a year at the University of Texas at Austin. In fact, you were very kind to come to that class last year. It's a LBJ School of Public Affairs graduate students talking about the politics and issues of the moment. In odd numbered years, we talk about the legislative session and even numbered years like the one we're in, we talk about the political season. Yeah. And so we conducted this class in person on schedule exactly as expected up until the point at which everything shut down. And we had wonderful guests, I mean, really big name guests, and we were very fortunate to get them to come, but they have to come to class. They have to be in Austin or they have to come to Austin. Right. So when the university announced that all classes were going to go online, I thought to myself, well, too bad for these students. They're going to miss out on the virtual, I mean, pardon me, on the, on the in-person experience of these students, of these uh, guests. But I thought, you know what? The aperture now opens in terms of who could potentially be a guest in this class because now the requirement is no longer that you be in Austin. You just have to be in a little box on our screens. Right. So the first three weeks that we were back in class, I arranged for a class of 17 master's students to have an hour in consecutive weeks with Julian Castro, Beto O'Rourke, and Pete wow. Buttigieg. And so the students, after the third week of getting access, 17 of them, to have an hour with each of these folks who had just come off of the presidential campaign trip. Right. Um, why didn't you take this class online sooner? <laughs> you know, they're, suddenly they're like, why did we do this ever in person? I mean, so in a lot of ways, you're correct. You know, the old saying, the old cliche, and like all cliches, it's it's true, right, at its core, that the door closes and a door opens. And the fact is that um, in the case of our lives going online, there are definitely negative aspects to it, but there are some positive aspects to it. And I think that one of the things we're going to have to do as we rebuild after this, because there will be an after this, right. is we're going to have to think about what aspects of the of this period are going to carry forward into the new normal. It is not going to be the same as it was before. Just as I was thinking about this last night, you know, before 9-11, yeah. we all engaged in certain behavior as it related to travel and security. Right. And then 9-11 happened and it was like, oh my God, we've never seen anything like this. Right. And there was a reset in terms of how we interacted with one another in certain settings, airports and others. And it seemed weird for a while until it didn't. And then things rose up around that experience like TSA pre-check for those of us who were fortunate enough to have it or clear as now those of us who are fortunate enough to subscribe to that service. And, you know, you kind of accommodated the new normal. And I think that what's going to happen with this, Bishop, is that in part related to the online aspects of our lives and in part not, we're going to have to accommodate to the new normal. And there are going to be things that will be different inevitably. And one of those may be that we no longer think we have to have classes in person so you're limited by physical proximity the aperture opens right well and i have some sense that uh there's a there's also commingled in this a real longing for uh relationship too and so yep. i think what 
part of it is it's not that the relationship will go away, but we will lean in differently. So, it, yep. so we will value the gatherings in different ways, right. and they will have to have a higher value in order. Uh, 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 oh, 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 no, no, no question about that. And I think I think so. I think to, to that point, I think we're gonna look for more opportunities than we ever have before to connect with people, understanding that that connection may happen along a different, a lot of different things. On a different plane. My birthday was earlier this week and my beloved wife um, arranged through, uh, you know, one of my friends from college, which is now, this is, I'm, I'm old, uh, unlike you. And so this is more than 30 years ago, arranged for friends of mine from that period, many of whom I had not seen or talked to in a little bit of a, a period of time to gather on a Zoom call, and we spent about an hour on, on the night of my birthday just shooting the breeze, catching up on stuff. Yeah. And you know, that's not something that in a normal circumstance necessarily would yeah. have happened. Right. And it was such a meaningful connection, it, and exactly to your point, because we are now robbed of that, right? We're robbed of those connections. And the importance of, first of all, a literal connection is gonna be greater, but then, you know, the rare times that we're actually in the same physical space as people, that's going to be much more valuable, yeah. you know? And so I'm, I'm, I, I do think that there's a reset in so many respects on that stuff. So, yeah. Now, first of all, you and I were born in the same year, so you can't throw that stuff around like that. Uh, you, know, you, you look a heck of a lot better than me, Bishop. I think the, 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 the spiritual life is, it looks better on you than the non-spiritual life looks on me. Oh, holiness. Yeah, right, yeah. Uh, somebody accused me of being my wife's father the other day, so we're we're good. Oh, you know? that's the sickest burn of all, right? That's uh, <laughs> terrible. He didn't even help me carry this stuff. I figured if he thought I, I was her dad, he he would have helped me some, but he didn't. Yeah, right, right. Uh, right. Tell me what you see as you're kind of looking out. I want to talk a little bit about Texas politics and what's going to yep. emerge over the fall, which which I think we're all really curious about. But first, before yep. we like. As you look at that landscape, both the political landscape and your world of swimming within the Texas Tribune, and I, I yeah. think you all have done a fantastic job. It's on my uh, uh, browser every morning when I get up to Great. look and see, especially the COVID covering, uh, uh, how you all are covering that, some of the statistics you're able to provide. But as you look at all, like, what brings you hope? Like, what is the, you, you think, that, that's kind of brilliant what just happened there. I think that's... Yeah. Really amazing. What do you see in Texas? So, so in, in, no, in no particular order, Bishop, here are the things that bring me hope. The first thing that brings me hope is an acknowledgement, because I've been around long enough, as apparently have you, that we know there's going to be an after. Right. right? There was the before. Right. And now we're in the during. Right. And there's going to be an after. There's going to be an after. This is not going to last forever. Right. So one of the things that gives me hope is just there's going to be an after. Nah. And, when we, and whatever the after looks like, there's going to be an after. Right. That's the first thing. The second thing is, I believe that this is not a time for politics. Mm. And although there are an awful lot of people who are playing politics, and there are a lot of people who are complaining about other people po playing politics at exactly the moment that they're playing politics, right? right? Right. I think that many of the things that have infected the republic over the last, pick the number of years, yeah. that infection actually does have a vaccine unlike the one that we're currently dealing with, right, the virus. And, that, and the vaccine is a recognition that we have to cut the crap and get back to figuring out the things that we agree on and moving ourselves and the world forward because the stakes have never been higher. And I, I, I'm in some ways um, heartened by that, that acknowledgement, that reality, that, um, that I do think that more and more people are coming to appreciate that the pettiness of what we accepted before as normal mm -hmm. is no longer acceptable. And I think that we'll have, a, it'll be a little bit like a juice cleanse, uh -huh. right? Yeah. That, that gives me hope. Um, I also would say within the universe of the Texas Tribune, since you brought that up and thank you for saying that it's on your browser, I'm seeing a greater level of engagement with the news and a greater desire for facts and information that are meaningful to people's lives than I have seen at any point in the 11 years we've been doing this. So on average, Bishop, we were getting about 2 million people a month on the Tribune's website, not counting the people who would encounter us through the doors of other news organizations, because part of our model from the very beginning is we give our content away to anybody who wants to reprint it. So on any given day, I'll see that our st stories are on the front page of the Denton paper and the San Angelo paper and the Lufkin paper and the Tyler paper. And this is great because those people in those communities are every bit as much Texans as you and I are in the big cities. Right. Um, they care the same as we do about schools and roads and healthcare and all that, but they're 
in a disadvantaged situation because they don't have a regular source of news in their local community. They can rely on they're in the so-called news deserts and we in the big cities at least have some. And that's not fair. Everybody is a Texan equally and they should be leveled in terms of their informedness. And so we've tried to provide that. So anyway, we get about 2 million a month pre-coronavirus and then we get distribution through these papers. And during the month of March, we got 10 million. Wow. So five times the number of our average month, the highest month ever, I think, was October of 2018, followed by November of 2018. That was about three million. Mm -hmm. So we were more than three times our highest month ever. We were five times our average month. Here in the month of April, where the interest in the coronavirus has abated as a driver of traffic to news sources, we're going to get only between five and six months. So it's um, a huge yeah. amount. Wow. It's a huge amount. And so we're going to reset. The, the, what I've seen over 11 years with our business is that there's a spike and then when it resets, it resets at a higher plateau than where right. it was previously. We saw that, for instance, with the Wendy Davis filibuster in 2013 of the abortion mm -hmm. legislation where we had this massive spike of traffic and then when it reset, it was higher. We saw this during Hurricane Harvey. We saw this during the families separated crisis and now we'll see it during the coronavirus. So what I'm heartened by, what I take hope in is the fact that more people are paying attention. Yeah. We have a terribly disengaged state, a terribly under-engaged state, given the population and given the stakes and given the number of issues that start in Texas and migrate out to the rest of the country, or because Texas is so big, the number of issues that start somewhere else and land on Texas with a thud. Everybody in Texas should be paying attention. Everybody in Texas does not. Really, up until 2018, our voter turnout was abysmal, down near the bottom of the 50 states. In 2018, it was 41st out of 50. That is not exactly a marketing slogan, Texas, where 41st out of 50 is the good news, right? But unfortunately, that's where we've been. And so I'm yeah, hopeful, yeah. maybe most of all, that this is a moment where that will reset along with everything. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm fascinated as I was thinking about that, uh, you know, that to the 16th and 17th century kind of emergence of politics as we know it today, deeply yep. rooted in this, I'm talking about just pure basic way in which we as modern people think about politics really moved out of the corridors of the elite uh, to, uh, I mean, and, and within a relatively short amount of time into a public space. Right. Uh, and, and along with that was uh, the cons a, a core piece of our values, made it even into the Constitution, the sense that, that, that the government really had to have the consent of the people. And that the people right. were engaged in that. So that was the kind of idea of that. And I think there was a lot of engagement in that moment of people for a lot of good reasons and bad reasons, and everything else, but there was a lot right. of engagement. And that engagement continued for, for hundreds of years, actually. But I do think we've come out of a period in which the engagement was to allow, basically through the consent, for them to be professional and do that on our behalf. And I would hope that maybe one of the good things coming out of this would be a kind of yeah. leaning back into our mutual responsibility. Uh, right. for, you know, and of course I have that perspective as a religious leader, but as Episcopalians, we've always believed that everybody should vote. Uh, doesn't matter what you vote for. We have ideas about that and, and, and want to support people in making good decisions, but we want people to engage in government. We've always been in kind of an engagement group right. of people. And so, well, well uh, I, I think Bishop, there, are, there, there are a couple of reasons why I think you're exactly right about that. The first is that people understand how, how high the stakes are and that they need to have a role in this representative democracy and expressing right. what their points of view are so that the, the people that we've put in elective office or people who are put in appointed office by others can act in our best interest. But the second thing is trust in government. Right. In yeah. what we hear and in what, we, what they do is so low. And so the public needs to assert itself as a counterweight to that. Look, I, I'm reminded of the old line, it's a double entendre, you know, the peasants are revolting, right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. The peasants, are, the peasants are also sometimes revolting. I mean, the fact is that when you hold open the door of representative democracy, the problem is that the public may sure. walk through it. And sometimes when the public walks through it, the result is not so great. It's messy. Um, but I think we would much prefer to have a situation in which people are engaged and involved and assert themselves, even if the byproducts of that are complicating than a situation in which we have a handful of elites making decisions for all of us. That is not what our system of government is supposed to be. And the, the challenge for us is to understand where along the continuum of mob rule on the one hand and a system in which people who 
gather in the back room with enormous puffs of cigar smoke enveloping them, make decisions. Like where along the continuum between those two points is the best place for us to land? Well, I, 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 yeah. I think there's some formation too. I mean, I think that's another piece uh, early on, uh, regardless of what you thought about it, there was core civic, you know, education and formation of citizens. That was all part yep. of public education. That also was part of that movement out of the 17th and 18th centuries. And so it was right. good that you would form the public. Public had to be formed to make those decisions in some right. way. You know, I think, uh, I'm not sure that that's gonna happen in schools, but it does mean it, it places a value on uh, any religious organization. I think it places a value on yep. the Trib Fest, it places a value uh, on uh, not-for-profits, how do we gather people and form them to do this work? And I think it, that, that level right. rises as we want engagement to do. Right, and, and the fact is that government can no longer do the things that it right. used to do sure. and, and honestly doesn't want to do them and doesn't have the resources to do them. And so it falls to nonprofits, as you said, it falls to um, the faith community. Um, we all have a place in this conversation and we all have a role to play some of us are more enthusiastic about playing it than others. And some of us have, I'm gonna say this carefully, some of us have more unselfish motives than others. Um, there, there are people who see this as an opportunity to be leveraged or exploited. And I think the problem is we don't need more of an infection in the body politic. Right. And there are some people who in the absence of, you know, official wisdom coming down, uh, see the opportunity to put misinformation or disinformation or their own spin into that process of educating, educating and engaging the public, and that is its own problem to be dealt with. Yes. You know, we have we have a long list of things to deal with these days, Bishop. And that's just one of them, but yeah. it is important. As so, we got a couple more questions. Uh, second to the last one. Yeah, uh, the fall is coming. Of you know, winter is, is coming, as they say. November yeah. will be here before we know yeah. it. Uh, we're, uh, as we look into that, kind of not what your prognostication is about who we'll see at the end of the ballot, but how do you think uh, we can yep. best do that together? Um, and yep. you know, based on our conversation, what do you think that fall will look like and bring for us? I think it's a very challenging uh, moment for uh, elections and for candidates and campaigns and for voters. Everything has been upturned. Everything we know about how you elect people to office from the very highest office in the land all the way down to dog catcher has been upturned. You cannot canvas. Uh, it is not a time really to be out raising money, small dollar contributions or large dollar contributions for political campaigns. It's gauche to do it, even though some are doing it. The ability of um, candidates to communicate with the people who might potentially vote for them, whether through traditional means or through a political convention, I'm convinced we're not gonna have any political conventions this year. That's been upturned. Um, and yet the outcomes of those elections have more of a bearing on all of our lives than at any point. I and mean, we always say in the media every four years, Bishop, this is the most important election of our lifetime. I know I told you four years ago that was the most important one. This is it. Though. Believe me now, this is literally the most important election of our <laughs> lifetime. And we're seeing what happens in an election bear fruit, juicy or, or rotten, depending upon your political perspective, today and every day. Right. This is yeah, what right. we're seeing today is a byproduct of the last election, sure. whether you like it or you don't like it. Right. Sure. Right? That's right. So so what do I think is going to happen? Well, we just witnessed in Wisconsin right. two really yes. interesting phenomena. The first phenomenon that we witnessed was the political apparatus actually completely counter to its message that we want more people to participate in this mm. participatory democracy of ours rearing up and saying, actually, maybe not. In a pandemic, there is absolutely no reason to say we don't want to expand vote by mail. In a pandemic, there is absolutely every reason not to require more people to commingle their germs. You do not put in front of a democratic society on the one side of the line, the right to vote, and on the other side of the line, the right not to die. And that is exactly what just happened. The Supreme Court of Wisconsin, endorsed by the Supreme Court of the United States, we're gonna force people to choose between democracy and death, right? Now, that's the first problem. The interesting thing that happened though, the second phenomenon, Bishop, is that the public said we choose democracy, bravely, bravely. And they turned out to vote. 
and the numbers were extraordinary and completely contrary to the wishes of those in power who sought to suppress the vote by making it a choice between democracy and death. Um, people said, I'm going to choose democracy because this is one of those now more than ever moments. Now, I will tell you that I saw on Twitter last night a fleeting mention of a number of cases of the coronavirus that have been confirmed that believe are believed to be directly attributable to people exercising their right to vote. Those are patriots, mm. those people. So what do I think is going to happen this fall? Well, the first thing is I think there is going to be a battle to the death, the literal death. Uh -huh. over how people can exercise their right to vote in this country oh, yes. at a moment of a pandemic. Because yeah. what you saw in Wisconsin is going to be replicated in 50 states. You're going to have people saying it is absurd in the year of our Lord 2020, when we pay for our property taxes with our phones and we pay for hummus at Whole Foods online, and we renew our driver's license online, and we do all of these things in a space that is presumed to be protected, that we cannot figure out a way, either digitally or in old fashioned paper and snail mail, to exercise this most important, most cherished of all rights. The president uh, of, uh, of the United States, the last president, Obama, President Obama, was here during South by Southwest in his last year as president, 2016. I had the honor of interviewing him in Austin. We had this very conversation about the fact that we do not in, in Texas, we do not have online voter registration. We do not have motor voter where you're automatically registered to vote when you get a driver's license. We do not have um, same day registration. We talk on the one hand about wanting to motivate more people to participate in this democracy of ours. But on the other hand, we seem to do everything we can in our power to ensure that they can't. And it is the states that have all these things in place, like for instance, Oregon, Valhalla, Xanadu, and Wakanda all in one the fell swoop as it when it comes to voting, right? All those things. Yeah. They have all those things. They have among the highest voter turnout. We have none of those things. We have among the lowest voter turnout. So I would say, and by the way, President Obama said, well, the reason that we don't have those things is not because they're not possible. It's because the people who run this state actually don't want you to vote. So I think we're going to be having that fight this that would be the That's going to be the big kind of- right. Oh. It, it is. And, and, you know, and again, the stakes couldn't be higher. Right. Um, and, um, you know, and again, and I would say, by the way, it's not just at the presidential level. Here in the state of Texas, we are on the verge of the Democrats having the opportunity to take back control of the Texas House. They may or may not. My bet at this point is they'll fall short. But the fact that it's even plausible is news. Two years ago, you wouldn't have believed that in 2020, we'd be talking about the possibility even that they could take back control of the House. Well, why is that important? We're heading into a redistricting cycle where the lines around our congressional and legislative districts are going to be redrawn, and they're going to be redrawn by whoever we elect to this legislature. So having a Democratic House versus a Republican House, the byproducts of that process will be materially different. So it's not just about the presidential race. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's about races down the ballot. And I think that's the interesting and, and, and important right, aspect right. of all of it. Well, and I, we've talked about, I've had the pleasure of having this conversation a number of times with you, and both yeah. uh, you with me and me with you, that right. you know, we've seen this coming. And the question is, when does it happen? And it's a, some of it's pure numbers. I mean, it's just the, it's a, it's a, uh, the uh, generating product of, migration in which you have people coming from the south and the east and the west like just the growth Indeed. in texas is going to change all of this don't know quite how and when but we've seen this coming but it, it'll be interesting to see how the the uh, conversation around uh voting and voting access uh as well as our own future here in texas plays out now last question and i know you have to go uh that's right uh mrs uh, i'm watching mrs mazel that's our new uh yeah. Little little racy in the beginning, but we're hooked. Uh, what uh, what good book are you reading, or what uh, we need some recommendations for all of our state yeah. folks? What are you reading or watching? So first, I'm going to give you my two word review, my three word review of uh, Mrs. Maisel. Yes, right. Not that marvelous. I realize that it is. Uh, I am taking the under on that. That I'm in. I'm in the minority on that. But I was like, it's okay. We're also. Yeah. We're also gonna recognize. We're also a month. In. We're a month in. So, <laughs> right. Um, uh, I I would say a couple things on um, uh, streaming. So the first thing is I tend to be in a kind of uh, easily caricatured way uh, captive to the BBC 
uh, crime shows, right. episodic series. Sure. Um, over the last 10 years, I have really grooved to shows like Happy Valley and Broadchurch. Yes, yeah. Um, yeah. And so anything that has, and we're actually are in the middle of watching a show called Shetland, Yes. Uh, uh, and I'm really interested. I love those shows. I could listen to uh, accented discussions of gruesome deaths, you know, <laughs> from morning until evening. Um, so, that, so that's absolutely something I've been doing. I will say that after a period of time in which I thought that it went fallow, um, I'm really enjoying the last season of Homeland. Um, given everything that's going on in the world, Homeland seems more and more like a documentary. To me than a show and speaking of shows that are documentaries uh, when they really weren't intended to be there's another show that i will recommend last television show um my friend hank stuver who used to be the uh, television critic and feature writer at the austin american statesman and is now the uh, correctly celebrated television critic of the washington post recommended at the end of last year a series called years and years that was on hbo it was a limited run it was about eight or nine episodes i think yeah. um and it actually scarily predicts the environment that we're in right now with regard to a pandemic and everything else. And I just think it was absolutely exceptional. So I would recommend that. Um, the, the, the book I'll tell you to read, which I've had the opportunity to read in advance, it's not actually officially out until next week, but I'm going to interview the author soon. And that's why I've read it. And I have to tell you, it's extraordinary, is a novel about a pandemic written many, many months ago before we had any idea of this. It's called The End of October. It is by Lawrence Wright, okay. the staff writer for the New Yorker magazine, who lives in Austin, who wrote The Looming Tower, who wrote uh, Going Clear, the book about Scientology, and who has written so many extraordinary books over the years. His ability to see into the future with the topic of this novel. Uh, I mean, you want to talk about fiction that sets up as a documentary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. So when, when this book comes out, and perhaps by the time people see this, it will be out, I would encourage you to read The End of October by Lawrence Wright. Do you know when your thing is going to air? Yes, yeah, so it's uh, so it's not a television program, but we're doing it in connection with the Paramount Theater in Austin. We're taping it this Friday, the twenty fourth, right. but it is going to go online on the thirtieth of April, as a Paramount Theater presents virtual event, and we will also stream it, or or not stream it because it won't be live, but we'll also uh, put the video right. on the Texas Tribune site as well. And I'll encourage you to watch it, but more importantly, to read uh, Larry's book. He's one of the absolute best writers of our lifetimes, and um, this is a great novel. Thank you. Thanks for doing this uh, uh, with me and I'll Happy to. talk in Texas politics and uh, wish you the very best with, uh, we know you've got a busy day and, and can, Thank you. I hope you also will share with your staff how much many of us enjoy their work. So I sure will. And Bishop, let me say, as I've said to you many times at the end of our time together, peace be with you. Peace be with you.